Um, I'm so pleased to have Perry Longo read with me today. Um, since Perry and I know each other for such a long time, we're going to have a conversation with our poetry. And then we want to open up the, uh, the reading to, um, or the, the conversation to everyone. Uh, we really want you to participate in the conversation. That's a big part of why I decided to do this, um, this kind of reading. And um, it's also something that Perry and I are going to talk more about because it's very important to us personally and, and in, our other, in the other work that we're doing besides poetry. Uh, um, we're going to start the reading. I'm seeing some old friends. It's really exciting for me. Um, we'll start the reading. I'm going to introduce Perry. Um, and, then, um, and then Perry will introduce me. And then we'll start reading our poems. So um, but there's a lot to say about Perry Longo. Um, she's been the Santa Barbara Poet Laureate in 2007 to 9. She has four books of poetry. Um, and she's been published quite a bit in, in many, many journals. Um, she's also been on the staff of the Santa Bar Barbara Writers Conference since 1984. She's taught poetry in many places. Um, and to many of us who are on this, at, at this meeting today, actually, um, poets in the schools and, and, uh, and uh, poets in general. She's also a registered poetry therapist, um, which means that she is at the height of being a poetry therapist. And she can explain a little more about that. She's done healing groups at Hospice of Santa Barbara and, um, <clears throat> and sanctuary centers. Um, and in 2005, she went to Kuwait. She was invited to go to Kuwait to speak about poetry as a way to peace. Um, so that's a little bit about Perry Longo. And now I'll let Perry introduce me. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to do that, Phyllis. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, we're going to talk more later about how we met each other. Um, so right now I'm going to introduce her. Um, uh, Phyllis is a psychotherapist and she specializes in trauma. And she also is a certified poetry therapist, which informs her work, which she will talk more about as she reads. And Phyllis weaves her own traumas into her poems as well. She has just published a new book of poetry called, <clears throat> excuse me, Full Moon Herald. And it's a poetic newspaper filled with real world news and personal news. She's been widely published in journals and anthologies. She's won finalist prizes and received several pushcart nominations. She sees writing as a dialogue between author and reader, an intimate relationship building process that fosters healing on many levels. Writing about the news is her way of taking action to counter feelings of overwhelm and loss. So Phyllis, thank you for inviting me and everybody, this is Phyllis. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> thank you. So, um, so Perry's gonna, gonna open up the poetry um, and um, her first poem, is it called Forecast? Yes, it's called okay. Forecast. Right. I wrote this poem a few years ago, a friend of mine, uh, her husband had just died and she herself was a teacher. And she said, Perry, what do I do when I'm teaching and all of a sudden I start crying? I said, oh, well, let me think about that. I'm not sure. Well, well, maybe I'll write a poem about it. And it was like the next day in the Santa Barbara News Press, which when we used to still get it, for those of you who don't know Santa Barbara, most people don't get the news press anymore. I won't go into that. Uh, but anyway, there was this little quote about the top of, they were giving the, the weather. So the poem begins with this little report. Um, and the quote is, El Nino equals chance for an extremely wet or dry season. Santa Barbara News Press, November 29th, 2014. 
High chance of rainfall likely or lower. A minor event Sunday, perhaps substantial Monday or Tuesday when it might be major or minor, 50 or 60%, unless it's stronger. Like the not so well known STUG, STUG, Sudden Transient Uprising of Grief that suffers no too well, succumbed to loss, simply going about daily business and are blindsided as if struck by a foul ball or worse, a tsunami, an upswelling of uncontrollable tears, breaking records, if not concentration, held to like the coast holds to a high pressure system and suddenly recedes with a shaking followed by a saturation of face, chest, torso. The heart empties with no muscle control, unable to arrest the grief, while those who witness honor the necessity of inner weather, trusting the predicament of the unpredictable, minor or substantial. And chance is life likely goes on, a drought here and there, hopefully more smoothly until the next time. No telling when. So my poem is um, for when you can't cry because you're numb. Moratorium. I long for lacrimose, for the beggar in a dog's eyes. I'm yearning for rain in deluge or drizzle, liquid as in laments. A thousand purple umbrellas as they float over my city. Where does it hide this sorrow? In a secret room above my shop? In a place a thief wouldn't find? Behind a wall, under a stone in the dirt? I can feel it brim in my exhausted eyes, brimming. For my neighbor's mottled mind, she comes to my door to say her sweet husband of 48 years wants to kill her. Brim for the children in the pictures, kidnapped over an address. To sob seems appropriate. Such a luxury, release the ache, water my dehydrated lawn. For the heat and its cousins flood fire pollution. For bullets, for childhood. I could go on and on. The newspaper should be too wet to read, memories too barbed to feel. Hurricane Phyllis broken up over the ocean, drifting away. When, when um, Phyllis and I were talking about what poems we were going to read, you know, not that many, uh, a theme popped up in this particular time that we're in. Uh, and as you're hearing the theme of grief, that there's all different kinds of ways to grieve. And uh, as we were talking on the phone the other day about what we would read, uh, I was reminded of this poem I wrote uh, some time ago, uh, and it's called Roadside Casket Lot. Down from hooking trout in icy Rocky Mountain creeks, grass packed around their rainbow backs in the creel for the long ride home. Grandpa just gone, dad slowed. Good time as any to check out a box. The highway had run out of high country splendor, dull and dusty, rents cheap, glaring signs. The salesman led grandma by the arm, the wake of us dragging behind as he named prices, mahogany, walnut, steel, most durable, best deals. He winked at grandma, two for the price of one. Whatever the price, she quipped an Irish brogue, eyebrows raised. Well then, I can't afford to die. He'll have to do it for both of us. 
Despite grief, we laughed the sun out of the sky among rows of caskets lit with otherworldly glow, mountains in silhouette, the salesman sputtering, time to close, come again. Memory dims, but for those trout, even if grandma fried them in too much fat and cornmeal, they tasted near heaven as we feasted, toasting grandpa, fishing out the bones. <laughs> um, so my next poem is actually about the drought. Um, <clears throat> and um, I, th I thought of reading this one because it's got some, um, the, the water in it is also a, a, a um, part of the healing of, of um, grief. It's called Try Not to Be Afraid of This Drought. And it has an epigraph that was, uh, Ocean Vuong was being interviewed and he said, the only place I have to hide is inside my poems. Try not to be afraid of this drought. So many clouds and the feeling of rain, but nothing pours. Everything shrivels. So dry the earth begs the sky to squeeze a few drops out of its mouth. So dry trees gasp, roots split into parched cracks. We hide, thirsty, inside this poem, only words to drink. Inside this poem, all the fear in the world and all that we lose. Then the oranges, juice dripping, and pomegranates, wild red seeds staining. Their tree roots beseech the subterranean lake, so deep. Find me, sunken under, water me. So much I've lost under my skin, down in the secret parts of me. Some things no return, but to come, the smell of rain, the rain itself, the tears. When I heard Phyllis's poem, you know, about the rain and, and grief is like that, you know, it's, it's there and it isn't and it's there and it isn't. Um, so here's a poem. Um, those of you who know me know my husband's been gone a long time. Uh, and I, I used to write poems I, every, Anna, every anniversary when it was a death anniversary. I don't do that uh, anymore, but I think this is one of the last times I might have done that. Fourteen lines between the summer equinox and your birthday. A sonnet of years since you left for the far shore sounds less formal than gone. I imagine you anchored in a bay dozing to seas, lazy lap, restored, perhaps in a hammock strung between two palms. Your last wish after all the suffering was to be one with wind and swell to carry you where they will. Such thought helps me miss our life together less. From this side of space, I stand at the bow, looking back at your wake, singing, singing a lenga, no problem. A phrase we learned in Fiji, blessed with the winning the lucky ticket to travel there. Stress aside, along with your watch, you scuba dove to explore the miracles of the deep. Above, I tread the bubbles of your breath, sunstruck, still now. So Perry, uh, why don't you read your, your COVID poem? Is that the next one? And then I'll read I, mine. So because we are, uh, have been for the in the COVID for uh, a year, as of yesterday, was it? Uh, Phyllis and I thought, well, maybe we should might each read a poem about that. So 
<clears throat> Unwalking the black cat during COVID. The one crossing my path outside past the planter box of red geraniums. I'm wiping down the groceries should the coronavirus crown me. You can't be too careful at my age. So I begin backstepping, unwalking cats slink in the Lysol scented air, bananas and grapes floating in a sink of soap. It's an Irish thing, hands covering the eyes to unsee what you saw, unwinding the clock, which makes sense to me curious where the day went at bedtime, where I unnews the news. Since quarantine, the top of my head has blown, turned snow, yet the cat bears not one whisk. Her stride uncolored me. Have I fallen for an old conspiracy? Remember that Celts say these cats, bless their unblinking stare, also bring good fortune, if you will. Love and good health at the stroke of twelve, or before if you cast your spell just right. I step outside to undo what plagues, retrace her steps forward, calling, here, kitty, 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 come on back. I find her in a whirl of dust in the field, out back, unwinding. Um, so, so here's my COVID poem. Um, I, um, I wanted to try to get uh, one into my book bef before it came out. Um, and I wrote this last, uh, I think probably last April. Um, and it turned out that there were two. So, uh, um, and the thing is that, you know, when you write something about the news, it, it gets stale right away. And I don't know, I mean, um, it, and some of the stuff it is stale, but some of it you read it and it still seems like it's still happening. So I don't know if that's a good thing or not, probably not in, in many cases. But anyway, um, the thing about this poem is that um, I do, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the future and I think we're there now. So it's called Disguised in a, as an Ordinary Spoon or Fork in a Handshake or, or the Air Between Us. Highly magnified, they look like many handled Nerf balls, stealth drones jumping from one set of human lungs to the next. Rabid science fiction monsters on a tainted spaceship. Can you say pandemic? Can you stop reading all the emails, the warnings everywhere? This fearsome, this formidable virus we have to dance with. Our hands now our enemies instruments of possible extermination. No touch and forget about a hug. This is the new solo tango. To be healthy is to wash all digits for 20 seconds while singing the chorus of I will survive. And don't touch doorknobs anymore. What is it about contact between fingers and face that is so irresistible? and human contact, how we notice its absence as all gatherings drain away and friendships go behind a curtain six feet wide. We saw the videos from China, but we're not used to this here. This new thing now, social distance, translates to home alone with your computer, phone, and wet wipes, if you can find any. Isolation. Let's hope for a new family in the White House. Let's hope for more music, more poetry, shared rooftop dinners from a safe distance, neighbors with food offers for the at-risk delivered to the door, and best of all, a vaccine that can step on Corona's toes, kick it out of the dance hall forever. And how do you know if you'll be the mild case, the one you dream can give immunity or the worst option and no time and maybe no ventilator to prepare for the end? This breath you used to take for granted, is it canceled? This ambush, this wretched air. 
I have one um, I wrote, uh, I think maybe November. No, I think a little later than that. Kind of on the same theme. It's called What Next? Considering the latest catastrophe, our family dog comes to mind who years ago chased the cat around the house whenever we said any word that sounded like cat, i.e. catastrophe. And the upheaval would shake loose anything perched on the table edge, i.e. grandma's forget-me-not flowered teacup, like the one I broke chasing my younger brother when we were little and mother yelled, watch yourself. Not my intention today as I try to drum up some joy essential in this multi catastrophic atmosphere. Today, it's the smell of a rat. My adult daughter claims is beneath the base of her bed. I sniff, the stench knocks me over. Good sign, no COVID. I forget breaking news, chase after the number for pest control who races over on time and a half, crawls under the house for a look and reappears as if from death in his dirt covered hazmat suit and metal double filtered mask holding a board chewed to pulp with burrowing termites. Specks to the eye that could destroy a house in months, he says, if left untreated, leaving me to consider the metaphor of a house divided that cannot stand, that must not stand, that one in DC. Suddenly, my daughter, despiser of all creepy crawlers, delivers a shriek as if being murdered that pokes a hole in the fog, the smoke, the heat, the horror of recent days, and we unpeel ourselves with rolls of laughter that set the neighbors calling over the fence, what's the matter over there? And we yell back, everything. Uh, I belong to a, a, um, a, a group that's part of a, the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. And um, we have in, in this group, there's a special interest group of us that are creative arts therapists. And uh, so we're getting together to, uh, to uh, plan a, a, a workshop for the conference that's coming up. And so I offered to write a poem that would help us uh, feel connected as a community. And this is what came out. Postcard from the reef. If adversity or loneliness has struck you like a hatchet, harpooned you with grief, come with me to Hawaii, to the Southern shore just off the coast of Molokai. And if you have danced with a brush in your hand, your creation song of pigments streamed of corals, pinks, blues, then come with me to the sea of damsel fish, rod tail file fish of yellow fin goat fish. Become a living statue of salvation in a school of well-wishers converged around you. Reefs crammed with yellow tangs, butterfly fish, trigger fish. Maybe they're just swimming. Maybe they chant your name. They sing. If you are trembling in an ocean of doubt, a hand will reach out for you, keep you from drowning. Our fins will be your life jackets. Come, glide with us. Our captain, short as an anchor, built wide as a beam of joy, likes to hug. His confidence, lush, a jungle planted on a rickety boat, spirit of the true Hawaii. We're snorkeling, faces submerged. Did you know you could do it? Swim alone in an ocean off a coast of an island, guest of a sunken costume party. Colors gouache of fish, coral, saltwater immersed rainforests. But too soon, it is, too, it is so cold. It is Hawaii in the air and Alaska in the water. You shake a human arrow in a quiver. Wind picks up, 
Salt water slaps into snorkel tube, choking. Time to swim to the boat. All the things we try to escape but can't. Until his hand, as he pulls you one-armed by the scruff of the neck out of that ocean to land on his deck. If you have been underwater, come with me. I'm afraid to. Rumi says, come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, we'll catch each other on the way into a threshold, on the way through. Well, I think I will. One, one more poem, fellas? Yeah. All Take right. Out. Yeah. So this this is spontaneous because I, I never heard this poem of Phyllis's and I was thinking oh that reminds me of a time I was in Hawaii but I don't have that poem available it's buried in my computer but I do have a poem sitting here uh, about a place that is certainly a place of wild uh, ocean and uh, so it's one of my I, uh, poems I wrote as a result of being in Ireland for two weeks, uh, yes, two weeks, um, coming up on five years ago. And one of the places uh, my son and I went was the Cliffs of Mohair. And uh, the, the, the poem I'm going to read is about that, which was um, a very special time in my life. Cliffs of Mohair, County Clare. Flight has dropped you right where the Ireland calendar on your kitchen wall left you thousands of miles ago. And since Dublin, days more of a good dose of twists and turns. Walking the precipitous edge of the cliffs, the day full sun, in the distance, row upon row of birds roost in an eon chewed niche. You peer down, to better hear the swish swash below after the seas crash against the walls, still forging the ridge. At the drop, stomach churns like the spume in, inside the blue whorl. You back off at a sign posting, danger, lives lost slipping over. A woman in a wheelchair, poised too close, gazes out, a man holding her firm. Perhaps this view a last wish. Suddenly flashes of white like flung arrows distract. Fulmars and kitty wakes playing like children gliding the spray. They whiz toward the dark cl cliff, rise, then tourjete back to sea in a kind of tease. Coming home, just kidding, back again, like exultations of souls unbound from flesh. What else can you do but run toward the tower at the very tip and lift all wing and weave? How do we get our conversation started? Do you want to start with um, uh, how we met? Um, sure. Uh, well, we, uh, we had met through the Poetry Therapy Association and Phyllis decided she wanted to get her credential and she contacted me. Um, I was a, uh, was and still am a mentor for those wanting to become a poetry therapist. And um, just about that time, my husband was in, uh, in the hospital getting special treatment uh, at Stanford and I just kind of met Phyllis maybe by the phone more than anything, I think, right, Phyllis? And I was telling Phyllis about this. My husband was in Stanford. I said, I feel so bad and I'm down here and I only can get up there on the weekend. Phyllis said, well, I'll go over and I'll, I'll talk to him. So she went over and spent an afternoon with my husband who was dying at the time, though we didn't know that was happening. And then, um, you know, life went on and I, I wrote a poem for, for Lois one day, I mean, Lois, excuse me, for Phyllis one day, and she returned a response to me to the poem I wrote her. I remember the poem I wrote was uh, Maybe Angels Are 
mistakes corrected. And, and Phyllis wrote a poem back. And it got us going on this uh, dimension of a person writes a poem and then you write a poem in response, which is why we sort of decided to set up our reading that way today. Mm -hmm. And um, and then Phyllis and I, that's how we, I, I think we got to know each other is the best way I have of, of putting that way. And we went to, you know, I became aware of Phyllis's work uh, in San Francisco in the Bay Area and she of mine. And then we just have stayed friends all those years. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'd like to add something to that. Mm -hmm. And I always admired Phyllis's work. And um, she came to some of my poetry. I, I did a summer poetry workshop in Santa Barbara for about 18 years. And Phyllis, I think you came to a couple of those. Mm -hmm. And Phyllis just published her first book of poetry, Full Moon Herald, which is a marvelous book, and asked me to write the blurb for her book, which I did. And and here we are, <laughs> 30 years later, or 20 years later, I guess. So, you know, I didn't really say how much um, I enjoyed the poetry that you read today, Perry, um, <clears throat> and how grateful I am that you, um, that you are here with me. And, um, and as you were talking, I was thinking, well, maybe it's not an accident that um, on so many levels that we read so many poems about grief, um, you know, based on the time that we're in. And then also the way that you and I became uh, extremely close, which had to do with that, with that experience um, that was also very spontaneous and, and um, meant so much to both of us. Um, so, yeah, so um, just thinking about um, how much all the things that we have done together over the years as well um, have meant to me and have really informed my idea of, uh, of writing in the sense of um, usually when I start to write a poem, I'm always thinking about another poem that I want to try to write a conversation with, even if it's not directly, it's it's indirectly. So this this whole experience of the of poets in conversation is something that's been with me for a really long time. Um, you know, and and I think it's something. You know, if we think about you know turning the comments or the thoughts of you know our reading or whatever we did over to everybody else to talk about, we're always mm -hmm. doing that. It's it's not like any new thing, it's been going on since, since the beginning of time. You know, somebody writes a poem, you're reading it in a book, you are moved and inspired, and, you know, maybe it's just a phrase and you write a poem back, and this has been, been going on. And I, I think we just sort of put it into the therapeutic context and said, okay, well, here's, you know, here's a wonderful poem uh, uh, that someone has written about grief. You know, because poems connect us not only to ourselves, but to each other. And so, you know, like with the work that I do at hospice, um, you, you know, you share a poem and then people talk about what speaks to them in the poem. And then, then I say, well, write that line down and then take it from there. And then they write a poem and then they're speaking to each other. And all of a sudden it makes this horrible uh, trauma and thing we are experiencing in life more manageable because it's like oh there's somebody who's going through through this and they're functioning <laughs> at least somewhat and i mean i i, I know in, in the hospice group you know we'll be going on and we'll be talking and you know this was pre-pandemic when we weren't on zoom and somebody would come by from out you know another staff person and say i thought this is supposed to be a grief group. You guys are, you're laughing way too much for grief because mm -hmm. you know, when, when, when you get under, when, when you say what you have to say, there's a lightning that can happen. And then, you know, you get on to, you get onto other things, even though it's always there as a part of it. And I think that happens in the poetic process. You know, our poems are constantly telling us things about ourselves. You know, we're making, connection we understand ourselves better and then each other and you know Phyllis I know you you have 
wonderful groups that you've worked with, uh, mm -hmm. poetry writing groups, um, as I have. Some of you are here today. Hi. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, everybody's work informs everybody else's work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one time I was in a, 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 a line to get my certificate signed for taking a CEU class. And the person in front of me said, um, oh, hi, Perry, are you still doing that poetry thing? Uh, I said, yeah, oh, yeah, all the time. And, she, and then she turned and she said to me, I hate poetry. And then <laughs> kind of walked away, you know, and what do you do with that? That's a poem, you know, I, I, I have yet to write, you know, when someone, someone knows, you know, that you, you work as a poet and they say, I hate poetry. Um, and, and, and so, you know, maybe, maybe I'll write a poem about, you know, what to say to somebody who says they hate poetry. I'm saying, oh, well, you know, how about breathing? How, how, how are you about breathing? Uh, because to me, poetry is like breathing. Ah, which reminds me, I always love this. Uh, I learned this a long time ago. Um, in the Inuit language, the word anerka, A-N-E-R-C-A, has two meanings to breathe and to make poetry. It's the same root word. Mm -hmm. I just thought, I'm so glad I just said what I said because it reminded me of that. I love that. Um, you know, I, I did poets in the schools for uh, 30 years and just retired from it, um, you know, probably about, I think four years ago. And I would always, <laughs> I would always say to the kids, um, uh, you know, poetry is about fun. You know, we, we play with words, we make up words, we have fun. And, you know, it's a way for you to get to know yourself. And I, I had this little boy and a critique, they had to fill out an evaluation to see if they would still keep paying us, you know. And, and, he, and he had the most wonderful comment I ever heard from a child. Poetry is better than Disneyland. <laughs> And I, you know, I keep that with me, you know, in my head with uh, some other wonderful things that, that, you know, kids have said. And I was just telling, you know, someone I'm helping doing some editing with yesterday. I said, you know, you can't put yourself down when you're writing a poem. You know, like when you just write a poem and you go, well, that's a piece of you know what, you know, and, and nothing in that. Um, I said, you can't do that because it's your child who comes out to play and if your child says he, he, he oh, oh is that is, is is really is that what you have to say about your new poem bye i'm, I'm going to go do something more fun you know so the muse leaves us you know it's hard to deal with that constant demon inside well i've gone on a rant i'm sorry um oh please no <laughs> <laughs> oh really yeah no we love yeah, we love to hear what you have to say. And actually, I was wondering if um, if we could get some people to unmute and say some more things or ask yeah, some questions. That would, be, so. that would be great. And 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 you know, get Phyllis's book. It is absolutely wonderful. It's like oh, the yes. paper, but it's all in poetry, and she tackles every different kind of news that you can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. And then she writes these wonderful poems from them so just um we have an appreciation in the chat if you if you feel too shy to um to ask the question on the recording um you can ask in the chat as well or make a comment so thank you lois for your for your comment um I, yeah please i do have a question both of you since you're talking about grief and you both have some grief in your poems, but you have different ways of getting to it. Um, you you mentioned uh, Perry has the the, uh, the sonnet, which is a, a form, and and um, and it's kind of a letter, kind of. So you said you wrote an anniversary date. You don't do that, but you did that, and then you have different ways of so, so, uh, using it. And, and my problem, I'm thinking. Um, 
in my at least my experience poetry world doesn't actually want you to talk about anything that's actually happening to you they want it to be in a sort of uh, objective way and then i personally have a, a, a hard time reaching the personal feelings about uh, grief in particular and i wonder do you write a journal do you write a free writing thing how do you how do you use when the, when you do have those feelings that are so strong about it but unformed that's I, a really I, I, yeah that's a wonderful question and as a matter of fact um i i think we can open this question up to everyone who's here um because it's um it it's a really rich question and and uh, we can learn about, you know, how we all do this. Um, so I, I, I personally, for me, the, um, it's, it's one of the most important things to write about is grief and loss. So it's coming up for me all the time. Maybe that's based on, you know, my, um, uh, my history. Um, so um, and I'm attracted to other people's poems about grief too. I'm really attracted to things that move me uh, and it doesn't have to be necessarily a positive. It can move me deeply, move me in some in, in emotionally. So how about other people? Um, if, if I'd like to say a word if now is, is, is her name? Oh, there you are, uh, Mary Marsha. Um, can you unmute again, Mary, and, and, and just state your uh, question one more time? If I'm, if I'm hearing it right, I think I'm hearing you say that Phyllis and I both write very differently. And you, you, you understand that it's not okay to write personally, it's better just to write more objectively. Is that your question, if that's- Sort okay? of. Okay, so it's a two part. It's first off, how do you process the writing to get to the poem that's going to be, that's trying to tackle whatever part of grief that you have or memory. And the second is, do you always formalize it in some way to mask it so it, that you're not, it's not so personal. It's, um, you're not really trying to tell people I'm going through a really hard time right now. You're trying to be a poet and separate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as Phyllis said, that's a that's a good question and a big question. So it's it's kind of a process question. Um, uh, I I have a, res a a response to the personal part because I write very personal poetry. I also write very narrative poetry, and when I hear you say. I write differently than Phyllis. Phyllis is probably more formal than I am. I don't know. Uh, I, I've never Quite really true. thought about that. Um, I was giving a reading someplace and the woman met me um, before dinner and she had bought a copy of my book at the time, which was The um, Privacy of Wind. And she was, she was sitting at the table and she, she uh, got the book and she was kind of leafing through it. She kind of went with the, with the pages. Do you know what I mean? And she said, and she was going to be introducing me. And she said, how can you do this? It's so personal. Everything you write is so personal. And I felt like, a sinner, you know, I was back in my Catholic school days, you know, it was like, I'm doing a bad thing, writing about myself. So my question back to you is, do you think, and, and, and it was, you know, I laughed it off, and I did my reading, and everything was fine. But I, I, I myself struggle with it sometimes, because I read other people's poetry, and they're so wonderful. And they're not as personal as mine. And I think it's, you know, maybe I shouldn't be so personal. You know, it's kind of late to, to change now since I've been writing for 60 years or something. But 
so let me do you think it's not good mary to write personally <laughs> well i think i have a lot that's that's personal that that is um <clears throat> That has used a mode of a, a, a metaphor, but it's quite obviously me as quite obviously personal. However, there are aspects of my personal life that are I find hard to access and hard to to get down. Pers particularly grief that stays with you like seeming forever because it, it's the, the close people in your life are not there. Um, anymore and um, when you get to it it just seems like a garble of, of personal uh, it, you know uh, overly sentimental and uh, so in, in just in processing how to go forth with it to um, to access it I guess is the only way I can say well there's some wonderful poets here in the sitting here in, mm -hmm. in this zoom room go ahead deborah oh thank you well i just wanted to say that and this is purely a personal response i can only speak for myself but um i think when i'm dealing with something that is strongly felt it helps a lot to just let it come out on paper completely uncensored not try to shape it in any way not try to expect that it's going to take a certain form just let it be what it is maybe go through three or four or five sessions of just letting it all tumble out and then choosing from that what really speaks to me, what feels strong. And sometimes in the end with a very personal and painful subject, I have found that using a highly structured form like a sonnet can be tremendously cathartic because you just have to channel all of that feeling into this tightly controlled form and it's really healing and the result hasn't always been something that I would want to oh. share with anybody but it's a great process. Thank you. Peg? Yeah I would just like to say that I, I don't think I mean if you've experienced grief you can't write about it and have it be impersonal and during the reading, I noticed that I had this smile on my face and I thought, wait a minute, why am I smiling? And then I realized it's because you're both so good at writing and so experienced that that hearing your point of view about it felt, you know, cleansing and healing and liberating. And, and that's, I think, as good as poetry gets. So I thank both of you. I thought it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah um, go ahead. Um, oh, let's see. So J Jarrett and then Alma. So um, I'm a student of Perry's and I think all of my poems are contain parts of being personal. I can't imagine myself, uh, by the way, and I agree with what Deborah said completely that uh, the only way I can write a poem is just to let it flow out and if I if I didn't feel like I could write a poem about grief I wouldn't even attempt it in other words the only thing that I end up writing are things that can come through me somewhat uh, without a whole lot of labor pains so to speak that if I have to struggle with something it never turns out well it has to flow right from the beginning to the end, or it's just, it's strained. It's, um, it's, um, it's not authentic. It's not, and it's probably not worth reading uh, if it doesn't just flow out freely. So Deborah, I'm, I'm on your side. Alma, did you? Oh, you're, you're muted. Yeah, you need to unmute. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to add, um, I mean, I've written a lot of grief and loss poems, as Perry knows. Um, and, and I think that, you know, part of what we have to do is get over the sense that that somehow our grief is shameful or unimportant or that, or that we're being trivial. The thing about art is that it, for me, 
it always has that element of the personal and the element of the universal. And, um, and what is more universal than, than grief and loss, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so for me, it's, it's kind of a process. It's, the idea is to honor, to honor that experience. And, uh, and you can't do that without being, you know, true to it and true and authentic to your grief. Mm -hmm. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've been taking um, some classes lately. That's my pandemic pleasure. I've been taking a lot of um, poetry classes. Um, I took a class, a 12 week class with Danusha Lamaris, um, and she, it was just so beautiful. Um, the way she set up the group is a small enough group that. Um, uh, we, we got to, everyone got to feel so safe, um, so interesting, like in, in the first one or two meetings to be able to bring in really personal um, work. And, um, and, um, and feel that it was going to be quite accepted. Um, and I guess there's a there's an art to being able to do that. And I think that, um, there's a really an importance to me of being able to write very personal work. Uh, now we may not want to share it with the world, um, but but Mary Marsha, I think it's really um, important to feel like it's okay to do it. And mm -hmm. and um, and as you as what I found, you know, as you as you um, get more permission from to read it to one person and get that feeling of like, it's okay. Um, and then maybe read it to one more person. I don't know, but um, you know, the whole idea of, of um, just that, that feeling of acceptance um, that's right. really helped me tremendously. Um, yeah. So, so uh, Gudrun, did you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I also agree with Deborah that giving yourself permission to just write about it and then maybe let it sit for a few days yeah. mm -hmm. and then at some point come back with it with your sort of uh, poetic sense or your, your, you know, your language. And I remember Perry always saying in the group when we were, when we were writing about grief or so that she doesn't criticize a poem written about grief, like let's say your dog died yesterday and you write a poet about grief the next day and you bring it to a group and she would always hold back criticizing it uh, or critiquing or some other stuff. Yeah. Right, that's the word I meant. Uh, that yeah. I, th I think just sort of allowing yourself to, to write about it and be honest about it. And you might read it back to you after three days and say, oh, this is really sort of over the top or, you know, but, but I think having a whole process with it. And I think then you end up with poems about grief like you have Phyllis and that, that Perry read. Because it sort of takes time. It doesn't have to all come in one day. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm also remembering another thing that Danusha just taught me, which is um, she has a, she had this idea of what she calls the broken body. <clears throat> and I brought in a poem that I thought was super personal and pretty, pretty broken. And she said, M more, I want more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I went back and I actually put in more. And, and that was really satisfying to, to have somebody tell me, you know, it's okay. Not only can you have it be as broken as you already felt it was, but now I want more. Um, so Noreen, did you? Yes, yeah. I do. First, I wanted to thank you both for doing this. And uh, it's so nice to see both of you. And I was thinking back on um, how, when you were talking about how you met, I thought about how I met Perry. And I actually met Perry at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference. And it must have been 30 years ago at this point. And I remember I was having a hard time um, putting out my poetry. Uh, with, with feeling like it was so precious, you know. And I felt uh, in the workshop that I attended with her that she really heard my voice. 
uh, there was something so uh, freeing for me and so forgiving. And so she really heard who I was and helped me craft some poems. And over the years, I think no matter how many other people I've worked with or other workshops I've gone to, I still hear that voice that was her voice in my mind. And I'm able to critique even the most personal poems to decide what I want in and what I want out um, based on more the craft. You, do you know what I mean? And you know, it's almost like you have this internal voice that says, yeah, that works. And, um, and it doesn't matter what then somebody else says to me, I still, I consider their opinion, but I know that it's almost an intuitive process at this point in my life. And I think there isn't any poetry that isn't personal. You know, even when you're talking about nature, you know, but the more I get to my heart to being as honest as I can in a poem or in prose, I, you know, that's when other people hear me. That's when people identify with me. So um, I don't know, I, I just had to share that experience. Mm -hmm. It's a, and it's, it's really uh, nice to see you both. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, I do I think just, many people, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Perry. Well, I just wanted to say it was wonderful to see Noreen and thank you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, me also. And, and I think that many people feel this way about Perry and, mm -hmm. and have her voice with us. Well, thank you, thank you. Hmm. There's somebody with Cynthia. the hand that says yeah. iPhone. <laughs> right, yes, I, I just wanted to chime in here. I wanted to thank you both for your reading. Um, you're both masterful writers. And for me, the most important thing about addressing grief and loss is to uh, actually be able to hear other people's work, uh, other people addressing it. And it's, um, you know, so we need so much support, you know, in, in uh, facing whatever it is we have to face. Um, and and uh, I always look, you know, outside myself, you know, for that support. And, and uh, I, I do have a great debt to Perry for that. And um, many, over many contexts over many years. So, um, and uh, I can, uh, agree with what Noreen said as I can hear that voice of Perry in my head off, you know, and, and uh, 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 experience that, um, that help, you know, and that support again. So, um, yeah, but really appreciate um, what you've done today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I also, I told Perry this yesterday that I do hear her voice in my head when I'm crafting a poem now. And it, it tells me to keep going, take more risks, become more personal because the personal is the universal. And that's how you reach people. And it's a, such a new feeling for me to know that, that I'm, I think I now understand even more greatly the power of poetry to change people's lives. And um, I've just been recently through a death in my family and I worked on a poem for several days and usually I wouldn't have stuck with it. But this time I went through several drafts of the poem. I would, I, at first when it hit me, I sat down and I, I have to write right away. You probably, all of you feel this way when it hits. And then I worked and worked and then I, I was really unhappy with it. Normally I would just not, I wouldn't go back to it, but I was really determined to honor the grief I was, I've been feeling. And so for three or four days, I would put it down and then pick it up. And I went through several drafts until finally, I think I, I, I found what I was looking for in the poem and I shared it with, with Perry. And you're right. It does. It sometimes takes just that one voice to, to forgive or reassure that then can allow the poetry to then speak for itself through me. And I thank you both for today. It's been a real honor to be able to be part of this, this, this group. And um, I so much appreciate it. Thank you. So glad you could make it and glad you said something too. I also wanted to say um, before we part company 
there, there is an association, the National Association for Poetry Therapy. And it's for, you know, poets and story writers and uh, journal writers and anything to do with the written word, the expressive arts. And they are having a conference and it's a Zoom conference. And it's not just therapy, it's all, you know, all different kinds of writing because ultimately all expressive arts are, are therapy, are therapeutic, ultimately. You know, you, you wear a different hat in doing it. You know, today we're gonna to talk about the person in the poem and over here, we're just gonna talk about the poem of the poem. They're not two separate paths. Um, one of my favorite quotes is by, uh, a quote comments, is from um, Gregory Orr, who accidentally shot his brother, you know, the great poet Gregory Orr, who accidentally shot his brother when he was 10. He was, they were deer hunting and he was carrying the gun and the gun went off and killed his brother and he wanted to die. And when he was in junior high school, the teacher told him about poetry and got him writing poetry. Mm -hmm. And one of his most famous essays says, every time I write a poem is proof I want to survive. Every time I write a poem. So when you are compelled to write a poem and you think, oh, I'm no good, you know, what is this? You know, I scribble, you know. Uh, every time you pick that pen up or put your fingers to the keyboard, that's proof you want to live and that's what we're talking about here you know our, our our that's 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 why we're all here today because that's how that's that's our obsession <laughs> so i want to invite you um to come under this coat with me so it it's a, a coat of poetry it's called incantation the coat of a poet is patchworked, warm, full enough to fit in everyone who wants to be there. We rest together in its tent of permissions and omissions, admissions, intuitions, paisley conf confessions. This inviolate space, this human errored space, we are fledglings huddled in its skyscrapered air, smell of planets, of earth musk. Listen to the banter of spring as she loosens her leaf felted robes. Birds flicker all around, moles dig in. Beneath this coat, we eat chocolate dipped in more chocolate. Sweetness spills, drops of honey fold into spiced tea to soothe our plaid misfortunes. The coat of a poet has seams for fears, tears for blisses, kisses of silk on skin. It can breeze smoke out of pockets and into a glossy night. When I sleep, it's a love or a friend rests in its place. If sleep is outside the window, it's my weighted blanket. Morning comes wearing woolly sunlight lightly around its shoulders. Oh. Mm. That was a delicious poem. Yes. I wish, I wish I'd heard that poem last night. I couldn't get to sleep. <laughs> I'll send it to you. <laughs> okay. I'll read it tonight before I go to bed. It's so beautiful. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. Well, thank you, Phyllis, for having me. And thank you all for coming and have a wonderful day. And thank you for being in my life. <laughs> <laughs> thank, well, thank you, Phyllis you. and Perry. Thank you, Perry. Thank you.